In 1971, in a reaction to the psychedelic revolution, the UN passed the Convention on Psychotropic Substances. The U.S. complied soon after with the Psychotropic Substances Act, adding psilocybin to the list of Schedule I drugs. These are substances considered to have no medicinal uses and a high potential for abuse. Drugs like heroin and GHB, the date rape drug. However, outside the U.S., psilocybin is used by multiple cultures for medicinal and ceremonial purposes. In recent years, scientists have been able to gather actual evidence of psilocybin's effects, leading multiple states to consider legalizing psilocybin. My guest tonight is at the helm of this movement in Oregon. Please welcome Tom Eckert. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a Glad real pleasure. Here. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Well, to start out, uh, tell us a little bit about your educational and professional background. What led you here? Oh, sure. Um, so back in the day, I went to the University of Michigan. I grew up in Michigan, went to the University of Michigan, great school, go blue. Uh, then went, did some grad school, uh, doctorate uh, degree, uh, worked toward a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. Spent about five years uh, in, that, in that environment. Actually didn't finish the degree, but got a master's degree in root and uh, started a, uh, a career in clinical psychology. Hmm. Yeah. And how did I get? into psychedelics that's a, kind of a longer story but there's <laughs> different different uh, layers to that one uh, certainly as a therapist you know I well there's kind of two tracks so certainly had some experiences like millions of Americans with uh, psychedelics along the way saw their potential um, as more than a party drug for sure um, but it was just kind of in the back of my mind that this is like really powerful stuff and it's kind of interesting that this is like a secret that this is uh, has such a, a powerful impact, uh, kind of in, in a, maybe a psycho-spiritual manner. Um, so I always knew that, but there wasn't really much avenue to kind of bring that out. And then I started later on, fast forward to not too long ago, maybe 2014, 2015, I kind of tuned into what was going on in the, in the research, uh, places like Johns Hopkins, uh, UCLA, uh, Imperial College of London, phenomenal studies with showing safety and efficacy around using psilocybin in a clinical fashion, addressing lots of uh, mental health issues, including depression, uh, addictions, um, PTSD, and anxiety disorders, end of life, psychological distress, and cancer patients, all these phenomenal uh, clinical outcomes, and behind those clinical outcomes, phenomenal human stories of transformation and the light bulb kind of went off. It's like I'm in a position where I kind of understand the clinical side of things. I have a voice in that respect and I've always kind of questioned uh, the medical model of psychiatry and psychology. It feels like it's missing the point, right? And uh, psychedelics bring something new to that conversation that's uniquely powerful and safe when approached in the right way. So that's what our interest has been. I wish my wife was here. She's uh, holding down the practice right now. She's our co-chief uh, co, um, petitioner of this, uh, of this legislation we're forwarding. Um, so love to talk about it. Yep. That's beautiful. I didn't know yeah. that you were doing this with your wife. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, absolutely. We do everything together. It's beautiful. Yeah, she's also a therapist. and So uh, her story is a little bit different than mine and they complement each other and we kind of capture a certain uh, kind of comprehensive look at why this is important and meaningful. She's very poetic and from the heart and, and also brings the therapeutic uh, part to it. So yeah, we're a great team. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, so what exactly is the psilocybin initiative? We, we mm -hmm. had a little chance to speak beforehand and you were saying that mm -hmm. a lot of the messaging that's not coming from you is mm -hmm. vastly incorrect. Would you take a moment to correct that? Tell us what this is, the Psilocybin Initiative. Yeah, so the Psilocybin Service Initiative is a ballot initiative. We're in the midst of a ballot initiative campaign for 2020. So we got a little time, but we're, it's, uh, we're intensifying. Uh, and the campaign is around legislation that we wrote. Um, called the Psilocybin Service Initiative of Oregon. 
uh, and it's a very detailed regulatory framework that allows access to what we call psilocybin services, uh, also known as psilocybin-assisted therapy. So it's really taking its cues from the science and the, the safety and best practice standards therein. Um, and it essentially will, will allow people, uh, not based on qualifying conditions, and what I mean by that is you don't have to have a diagnosis, you don't have, a, have to have a mental illness, you know, signed off by a psychiatrist to access these services, but you do approach it in a therapeutic way. So that means that you would uh, have a preparation session where you meet your facilitator and you uh, make a connection and you talk about what it is that you're uh, trying to achieve through uh, the psilocybin session. And then a few days later, perhaps, you have an administration session where you take the psilocybin. Uh, now, that's not a talk therapy session. That's kind of uh, blindfolds, listening to uh, uh, music, potentially, and going inward and letting the psilocybin do what it does. And we can talk more about that. And then afterwards, maybe a few days later, you have what's called an integration session, which is where you again meet with your facilitator and you uh, talk about the impact of the experience, how you're going to integrate uh, the insights, the emotional breakthroughs, uh, the perspective shift into your daily life and how it might affect your daily habits, how it changes your perspective on relationships, any number of things. And it's different for different people because uh, we, we approach uh, the experience with our own stuff. So it's, it's a unique um, intervention that really doesn't fall in the same box as what's conventionally understood to be either psych, uh, psychiatry or even therapeutic, uh, like talk therapy. It's very different. Mm -hmm. very it has, a cha it has a, the potential to really reformat and revolutionize mental health care. And I think that's a very strong argument to support this initiative because we're in the midst of a mental health crisis. You know, Oregon is uh, dead last with regard to mental illness rates. Uh, one in six Oregonians are diagnosed with a mental illness. Uh, the, the paradigms of care are kind of lacking. There's just a lot of problems. And so we need uh, solutions. We need to think out of the box. And this is a, a out of the box um, solution that just happens to have a ton, well, not a ton, but a growing uh, body of evidence uh, in the research that's supporting this as a, again, a unique, a safe and uniquely effective uh, approach. I, you kind of touched on a little bit, mm -hmm. but I, I really want to make sure that we get into mm -hmm. what are the actual effects of psilocybin. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of misinformation out there. People think that you're going to see mm -hmm. dragons and jump off mm -hmm. of a roof. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, first of all, the safety is key. So this is not a legis piece of legislation that legalizes psilocybin for you to buy and take home and do in the wrong kind of settings that can potentially spin you out into bad things. But that's exactly what this legislation uh, uh, guards against. Basically, you, you go to a facility, you are in a proper setting, and this is very key, and this has been known for a long time, that setting is super important as to uh, how an experience unfolds. So if you do psilocybin, so the psilocybin, psilocybin puts you in a vulnerable state of mind, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if you do it in the wrong setting, at a rock concert and whatnot, you might have an amazing experience. A lot of people do, but you might not. Now, in a um, supervised, guided session, in the right setting, you will find benefit more than likely. That doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have the, uh, um, well, let's just back up. So a lot of people have what we call a mystical type experience, right? And that is full of love and connectedness and uh, centeredness. It kind of opens up all the uh, chambers of your psyche that you might have locked away, allows you to go places that you might not have gone. And so it's very therapeutic in that way. Um, but it's not always, you know, all roses. For example, if you are someone who's struggling with addictions, 
uh, if you think about that, addictions is kind of a um, issue of avoidance in some ways. You're, you're, um, you're probably dealing with trauma, okay? And so psilocybin is going to allow you potentially to unlock those doors and work with some of these uh, locked away uh, traumas and, and face things that are hard to face. Okay, so that doesn't make for a necessarily a, a, a um, easy experience. That'd be a challenging experience. But with proper guidance, it becomes a healing experience. So even people who have a difficult experience, uh, six month, months later show uh, benefit from it. Um, but typically, uh, we see these mystical elements, this sense of connectedness, this sense of awe and beauty and uh, things of that nature. And that's very therapeutic for a lot of different reasons, uh, especially when you're dealing with people who are stuck, who have uh, cycles of depression and cycles of anxiety. It kind of turns that part of the brain off and activates these deeper layers, the deeper regions of the brain, uh, and this kind of mystical experience arises and so it's a reprieve from the uh, cycles of depression and whatnot, but it's also a chance to shift perspective, and that's what helps a lot of people. If this measure passes, uh, I think I've been able to glean a little bit of this, mm -hmm. but who will really benefit? Our, it mm -hmm. sounds like mm -hmm. a lot of Oregonians, uh, veterans, mm -hmm. would be hugely benefited by this. Who all do you see mm -hmm. benefiting from this measure if it passes? Well, I think lots of people. Uh, it's certainly people who struggle with um, mental illness. Now, it's not the right approach for all issues. For example, if you are someone who struggles with psychosis, this isn't the right avenue for you. Um, and you can kind of understand that conceptually. Like, there's a whole category of mental health issues that involved, involved kind of a, a stagnancy or stuckness of mind. Okay, mm -hmm. so think about PTSD. You're stuck in that place of trauma and it triggered, triggers very easily and you just kind of get this uh, repetitive re-traumatization essentially. Depression is like um, cycling thoughts and emotions that you can't seem to break out of. Uh, anxiety, worrying, same kind of deal. Um, even think addiction, you know, patterns of behavior. Uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is kind of like a tight uh, wheel of behavior. So any um, mental health issue that involves kind of a stuck state of mind, psilocybin uh, kind of breaks you out of that. Um, and it does so in a way uh, that is uh, exceptionally powerful in the sense that uh, you know, the, the research is generally working with people who have not seen benefit from other f forms of intervention. So it's kind of like their last hope, and it's breaking through where other interventions fail. Uh, so that's hugely beneficial. There are some desperate folks out there who need, who are suffering, who, who need this help. And so there's an urgency around this. Um, so that's number one. I mean, like, we need to help those people. Um, but more generally, uh, psilocybin, you know, there's all this very interesting material in the research. So the research will focus on depression, but then they'll also include lots of different scales to measure what's going on because they have this opportunity. It's very hard to get this research going because you have to break through all this red tape uh, through the FDA and all that stuff because it's a Schedule One drug. So you pack in as much as you can in the study. You want to learn as much as you can. So what you find out is that psilocybin also, for example, uh, uh, tends to create personality change, uh, which is an astounding finding because as a therapist, uh, you know that personality, by definition, you know, doesn't change. It's the part of us that is, is kind of constant. So here's... Uh, an inter intervention that can potentially uh, operate on a particular aspect of personality called openness. Okay, so this is one of 
uh, one of the factors of personality that a five-factor empirical personality model, openness, right? And so it's been shown that psilocybin with great frequency uh, increases openness. So openness, what is openness? It's related to things like creativity. It's related to empathy. It's related to all these good things. And so regular folks who have a guided psilocybin experience very often have positive outcomes in their lives, you know, aside from mental health issues, just they become more connected, more empathic, more creative, more in tune and in harmony with themselves, deeper self-acceptance, things of that nature. So there's a, you know, when you, when you start talking like that, you realize this is a, a really unique, you know, we live in an age where the medical model dominates uh, psychology and psychiatry. And so you have these targeted interventions trying to reduce specific symptoms, right? So now you have this different kind of approach, very different kind of approach, that's based on an experience, okay? Not, not daily dosing psych meds, but an actual experience that changes you in lasting ways. And the research shows that six months later, nine months later, there is, uh, you know, lasting change. Now, it tails off a little bit, but compared to uh, conventional approaches, it's pretty remarkable. So we're just getting a, we're, we're I mean, you, you had mentioned this is, there's ancient use, there's indigenous use. You know, a lot of people already know about this stuff, but in terms of like the, the Western model, we're just kind of learning what this can do. Very exciting of an old world solution mm -hmm. to one of the biggest problems we have in modern, uh, yeah, it's, well, modern society today. It has a kind of a poetic piece to it. It's like nature is providing yeah. this existential medicine as only nature can, right? And there's something beautiful about that. And it's, you know, it's true. I mean, we use science to kind of get out the truth, which I'm all for. And it's, it's, getting clearer and clearer that uh, this is a, you know, it's not a panacea. I don't want to oversell it. It's not like going to save the world. It's not going to solve everybody's problems. But it does work. It, it has a uh, real utility and it also represents something in our culture to accept uh, something like this and to, instead of stigmatize it, embrace it as part of the milieu of uh, possibilities uh, to support mental wellness. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, we don't have a ton of time left, so I want to get just a couple of other yeah, like yeah. nuts and bolts type yeah, of things in there. Is there any associated cost to the taxpayers? No, it's uh, budget neutral, meaning that um, the uh, money that supports the program that will be cre created in the Oregon Health Authority uh, will be collected through uh, application fees and a small tax that will be on uh, the transaction of psilocybin itself between manufacturers and service centers. So it's self-contained. It, it pays for itself. Uh, it won't be hitting up the taxpayers for anything extra. Fantastic. Why psilocybin over other substances? Mm -hmm. We've mentioned a little bit that there's some old world wisdom mm -hmm. that might mm -hmm. have informed this. Mm -hmm. There's loads of other drugs. Mm -hmm. Why psilocybin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the psychedelics are interesting, no doubt about it. Uh, we chose psilocybin for a few reasons. One, it's uh, the, the science is, is pretty advanced. Um, so other drugs like LSD and ayahuasca have interesting uh, histories and effects, uh, but not a lot of science to back it up at this point. Psilocybin is also uh, easy to work with. It's um, a little bit softer around the edges than some of the other psychedelics. For example, ayahuasca uh, tends to create uh, vomiting and things like that. Psilocybin is easier to work with. Um, it's, it's, it's processed really easy by the body, like it's non-toxic, that's important to out there people there's a part of the stigma like is it's a drug well it's actually a mushroom <laughs> and 
it's easily processed by the body. The body works with it rather well. It has huge effect on consciousness, but the body itself processes it, processes it pretty easily. And that means that it's a, the duration isn't overly long. It tends to be about four to six hours, which is a good chunk of time, but LSD is like eight hours. Ayahuasca is a little longer. So uh, those are a few reasons, um, mostly because the science is in place or developing. So this isn't something that just magically popped up out of nowhere. This is definitely something that is science-based. We mm -hmm, have a mm -hmm, lot mm -hmm. of information behind this. Yeah, and the scientific, you know, we talk about the psychedelic renaissance in science, you know, for those of us who are, are kind of in this world and paying attention to it. So that, there was a moratorium. You, you mentioned the, the legis, you know, how it got banned in uh, 1972 here with the, Nixon and all that and so there's all that kind of back history and then it just vanished and and uh, the uh, scientific research was uh, just put on hold for f what 45 years the longest time right and very little was going on and then about 2006 uh, the great team at Johns Hopkins uh, Roland Griffiths uh, had a landmark study that looked at psilocybin, broke through all the red tape. They're kind of heroes when you think about that because it was really hard to break through all that. Roland Griffiths is a uh, um, decorated scientist, right? So he turned his attention to this. And everyone else that was involved, many others I'm not mentioning, that are, are great scientists and approached it with extra rigor because of the history, right? Because, you know, we've got to make sure that these are the tightest studies, you know, double blind, da da da. And uh, so they're excellent studies happening at excellent universities. Um, and so that's a great foundation to work off uh, when you're trying to uh, look at policy reform in this, in this world. Um, yeah. So we we talked a little bit about the uh, the process of the multiple visits and mm -hmm. the kind of guided tour through your own mind. Yeah. Uh, what is the framework for safety involved in that? Involved mm -hmm. in uh, the licensing of these? Yeah. Guiders? Service centers facilitators we call them. Facilitators. So That's in in the. In the language of the initiative, it creates uh, standalone licenses for service centers. So this is where you'd go to uh, have the service to, to do the therapy. Uh, you have licenses for facilitators um, who are the guides, right? And of course, for the manufacturers, people who are growing psilocybin, converting it into what we call psilocybin products, which could be a gummy bear or something like that that has psilocybin in it. Um, so there's regulations around all of it, um, and for example, the facilitators to become licensed uh, go through intensive training, and included in that training is all the safety standards, best practice standards, which are evolving and will be, will continue to evolve and be uh, refined via an, an advisory board uh, of experts. So Sheree and I didn't delineate every factor because you know we're not the ultimate experts we put in the language that there will be an advisory board of experts that will get together and talk about what a curriculum looks like to become a trained facilitator what are the, uh, the safety precautions that are necessary and you know this isn't reinventing the wheel They've, they're doing this in the, the research uh, so um, there's a lot of thought and uh, detail and uh, a, a kind of comprehensive regulatory framework to ensure best practice standards. Mm -hmm. As this is, is moving towards a, a more accepted form of medicine, are you at all worried that Big Pharma is going to come in with some sort of synthetic? Is, how is that accounted for? Sure. Um, so, firstly, psilocybin is off patent, 
meaning no one can own psilocybin itself, right? Uh, you could potentially patent um, delivery methods and tweak uh, things here and there to um, kind of uh, pull into uh, a more pharma-based approach. Are we worried about that uh, somewhat? Uh, on the other hand, we took precautions with the language itself. For example, we ensured that we put a clause in there that says that the OHA can't um, uh, exclude organic psilocybin. So they can't just say, you know what, we're only doing synthetic and we're farming that out to the big pharma companies, right? So uh, using mushrooms themselves or extracting from mushrooms will always be part of the picture. There will always be an opportunity to do that. Um, so we, and, and the, you know, we tried to pull it away from the medical model. As I said, I have issues with the whole approach of uh, psychiatry and psychology, so everything was infused with the spirit of protecting uh, this model from becoming what we don't want it to become, which I don't even know what that would be. I don't know how pharma would kind of turn this into some kind of uh, dehumanized thing, you know, but, but we... Don't challenge them. Yeah, I know. I just, <laughs> you, you protect what you can. You, 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 uh, you set up the groundwork for a community-based framework of service provision where we take care of each other and everyone has an opportunity to become licensed if they have the heart and discipline to do that and it's not going to be taken away into hospitals and medical facilities only, like we put language in there that said that can't happen. So we did everything we could. Yeah. Is there, to kind of go back to that point a little bit that you mentioned earlier, just, so if somebody feels depressed, yeah. but they don't maybe have insurance to go mm -hmm. get a diagnosis of depression, right? they're still able Mm -hmm. to go in and have this initial conversation mm -hmm. with one of the facilitators. That's absolutely right. So this would be another way in for everybody mm -hmm. into it's better open. mental health. It's open to everybody, yeah. Yeah. Now, that pulls it outside of the realm of insurance coverage, more than likely. Now, that could evolve. We'll see. But it's like psychotherapy, like you don't have to have a diagnosis to come see me to do talk therapy. Now, whether you're going to get that covered by Providence or something, that's another story. But there's nothing to stop you from just working on yourself. And that's key, you know, and that's part of what this initiative is about. It's about mental wellness as well as uh, uh, addressing mental health issues. I mean, I don't, I don't really separate the two we're all human beings we're all on a continuum we all have it we're all a little bit broken you know what I mean so as a therapist I can tell you that it's a pretty useless exercise to slap diagnoses on everything you know some might disagree with me but uh, I've been in private practice for a long time and you have to like do that to meet insurance requirements and this and that and it always kind of annoys me you know it's like well, that it doesn't have anything to do with the human relationship and so the whole model the medical model for example kind of a philosophical position is that the healing power is with the provider and with the pills that they're peddling you know it's out there you need it's like it's like uh kind of like everything else in society it's just you know you know the commercials you know they tell you everything that's wrong with you and then they give you they give you the solution in a pill right and, and two that's minutes of how it's going to kill you it's yeah it's kind of like reflects the affliction of our culture in a way um, so here's a new model that puts the healing power inside of you now granted it's mediated by this little piece of nature right but it's not this mushroom that does it, it opens some doors in your mind, it loosens up some, uh, some kind of locked away stuff in your mind, uh, but it's you who has to walk forward and, and do the work. So psilocybin helps you solve your own issues, right? Whereas uh, pharma meds are all about reducing symptoms, not getting at root causes, right? Um, so this 
approach is all about root causes, getting to the bottom of things. Um, whether you're sick or not, you know, it's, as a human being, getting to the bottom of things, kind of understanding your human condition, right, and empowering yourself from that place. You know, it may take take a lot of tears. It may take you know, different avenues to getting your footing underneath you. Um, but that is what the doctor ordered, so to speak, right? <laughs> you know, that's what we need. And we need the uh, kind of, we need what that represents as well. I mean, it heals people and it also represents a new way of approaching things in a culture that's kind of sick in, in this way that, it, that, yeah, there's a whole discussion to be had there. I think you know, I think you get where I'm coming from. I think I do. I hear you. <laughs> Mm. And I fully agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, how will this measure compare and collaborate with uh, current compassionate care and decriminalization efforts? Mm -hmm. Are you partnering up? Are you buddied with anybody? Do you think, actually, we've got it right here. Let's yeah, do it's this. Yeah, it's actually, um, so our initiative is the, uh, is you, it's really the only document of its kind in the world right now because it's a full comprehensive framework to allow uh, people to access psilocybin therapy legally. Okay? Decrim doesn't do that. Okay? So decrim does not create the possibility of therapy. It means you can grow mushrooms at home and no one can bust down your door and so you can't do that, not that that was happening anyways, but it's nice to know they can't. So it's, it's a positive thing, um, but it doesn't go nearly as far. You know. our, our hope and our interest is to um, team up with the Drug Policy Alliance, which is a very powerful group uh, nationally that is, uh, and this is kind of breaking news on your show here, um, what they want to do is evaluate here in Oregon uh, the viability of a decrim uh, bill across the board, Portugal style. So a full decriminalization of all drugs, rerouting those funds into compassionate care, like you say, and reformatting, uh, basically cutting the legs out of the drug war. And they're looking at Oregon as the first state to potentially do this. Now, they haven't uh, decided yet. They, they don't do anything that they can't win. So first they're going to do a lot of polling and they're going to do a lot of evaluation. Uh, but they've chosen Oregon to do that evaluation because they think this is the place to start. So that's interesting. Now to me, that's starting to make sense. Because now you have a bill focused on creating access to psychedelic therapy uh, next to a bill that's decrimming all drugs and, and reformatting this whole drug war fiasco. That's the way the country should go. Okay. And I'm hoping that we can facilitate that. Um, I appreciate the, the, the decrim efforts around psilocybin. Um, I see some issues with it. I wonder why we're decrimming one particular drug that does not lead to a lot of arrests and does not out disproportionately affect people of color. You know, when you start getting into why decrim is important, you get into bigger issues that are separate from psilocybin therapy. So our interest was always to get psilocybin therapy on the board. And the DPA's interest is much broader. And uh, that, to me, makes more sense. That is interesting. That's, mm -hmm. I am proud to be an Oregonian. That's really neat. Um, to go off of that, I, what are your polling numbers? Mm -hmm. are, are you seeing a lot of, of positivity coming back at mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm, I don't see any 
protesters outside of our studio today, so I, I guess we're, we're early on. Doing you know, okay. well, yeah, yeah. The, we did a little bit of polling, and it was positive. Um, so it was kind of split. So basically, the process of getting to where we're at, we had to uh, write this legislation, move that through a process of what they call ballot titling. So that goes through the attorney general. They give you a little caption of summary. There's like 50 pages of regulations and they sum it up in literally 15 words so and then like a paragraph about what a yes vote means and what a no vote means and so we took that caption and the yes and no vote and we used that we just like gave people that without any other information like what, would you vote yes or no today right and so 47 percent would vote yes 40 uh, four percent would vote no, and seven percent was undecided. So that was wow. good. Mm -hmm. Then we gave them a little bit more information about what, you know, what psilocybin assisted therapy is, and this is a paragraph, um, and that this legislation was, you know, uh, trying to create access to psilocybin assisted therapy, and the number shot up to sixty-four percent. So when you educate people as to what this is, and they understand it a little bit, suddenly the numbers go way up. So that clarifies the need to educate the public, and that's what a campaign is a lot about. So we're gonna do that, and uh, work real hard at helping people understand what this is and what it isn't, you know, because I think a lot of those no votes are just jumping to conclusions. Um, but to answer your question, the polling looked pretty good. That yeah. is exciting. Yeah. And voter education, that's what we're here for. That's right. That's exactly well, what we we're are. here for. <laughs> I, yeah. We're coming close, so I have a couple of questions left. Have I mm -hmm. missed anything that you feel our viewers really need to know about this? Mm. Well, um, kind of the stigma issues, you know, I think that it's important to make clear that psilocybin services are uh, going to be done in private centers. It's not coming to your neighborhoods. This isn't going to be done in people's homes. You have to have a facility that's not zoned residential. So nobody's coming into your neighborhoods to do psychedelics, right? It's not, it's, it's 21 and over, no children involved. Um, so there's every precaution was taken, in other words, to make the focus on uh, compassionate care and therapy um, and yeah just what we've been talking about the research shows that it's a, a safe and effective way to treat uh, people who are suffering uh, and that's quite needed right now and in a bigger scope it really uh, brings a new perspective to the healthcare system uh, and I think that's important mm -hmm. Tell me more about how we get involved. What can we do sure. to support this? Sure, sure. Well, certainly uh, finances and fundraising is key. You know, we've got huge projects ahead. We have uh, to gather close to 150,000 signatures uh, to put this on the ballot in 2020. So the official number is 112,000. You have to get a lot more than that to make sure that you, you know, actually get valid signatures. So that's an enormous project that costs in the range of a half million bucks. So uh, we are working on that fundraising. We're making progress. We have uh, a ways to go. We are certainly in, in dialogue with some important um, players uh, nationally and internationally that hopefully will be supporting this as we move forward. But really, the bulk of the support needs to come here locally. We've had some amazing people step up to give us a good start. Uh, so fundraising, and that can be uh, done on our website, um, psi-2020.org. Uh, would you mind? That's PSI, yes. Thank you. PSI-2020.org. Uh, you can donate there and also learn more about the initiative. Um, Aside from donating, uh, the signature um, push is upon us. 
Um, we're going to try to put a paid force on the ground to cover the bulk of it, but also a volunteer force. So if you're interested in volunteering, uh, hit me up. You can do that through the website. Um, we've kind of paused it for a little while because we're getting together a um, administrative team to take care, to take on this huge task. You know, we started gathering signatures, felt a little bit like we weren't giving enough attention to the volunteers to kind of um, manage the whole thing. So we're going to have a management team in place so everyone kind of knows what's going on and knows where they can go and can connect with each other and all that. So in the next couple months, that should all be in place and uh, we'll open the floodgates of volunteers and make this happen, which is exciting. You know. um, other than that, you know, it's helpful when people approach with ideas and with skill sets instead of saying, how can I help? Because, you know, I don't have just jobs ready for everyone. I have, if somebody comes and says, I, I have, I build websites or I have IT experience or I, I do, I'm a graphic designer, I like to make posters. That is really helpful to work with, you know. Bring us your skills and we can uh, integrate it into this comprehensive um, uh, messaging project, you know, getting to the education piece, you know, from the, from where Sheree and I sit, we're interested in figuring out how to message to different groups of people, but we need the skills to carry that out and penetrate different communities. So you're looking for a bunch of different voices to come and join the chorus, essentially. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And ideas, you know, it's kind of an open, uh, forum, you know, like if you if you know of a way, if you'd have a a group of people that we could connect with, if you have um, a venue, if you know, there's all kinds of things. So be creative, think about how best to to get the word out, and we'll work with you. Yeah. Uh, what are your deadlines? Um, if so you don't have my signature, which you have mine, but if you uh, don't. Have yeah. the signature yeah. by this date. You're out of luck for helping us. What is that? Yeah, no, uh, July of 2020. July of 2020. We'd love to be way out ahead of that. So let's let's get on it uh, this year. Um, but we have up. We've got about a year left. That's really the crunch time in a political mm -hmm. campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things are going to get. Race. Yeah, it's going to be um, a really fascinating run from here on out. <laughs> yeah. One more time in a elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. What is this bill? Why do we need it? Why do these people's signatures need to be on one of these mm -hmm. within the next year? Well, real healing and real change. The psilocybin service initiative creates access to a form of therapy that helps people who are otherwise suffering and can't find services that that meet their needs. Uh, so, and real change, it, it revolutionized mental health care in a time when we're, the evidence is in, you know, what we're doing isn't working. It spells crisis. So, real healing, real change. Tom, Mr. Eckert, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate you coming to educate us and educate our viewers. This has been a, a really, fantastic conversation. Oh, my pleasure. And, you know, you and everyone out there, we are the campaign. So let's, let's get this done. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. Please, if you would like to support this very important measure, please get your signature onto one of these sheets. <laughs> Preferably before an entire year. Let's see, <laughs> let's see if we can get Tom a little bit more sleep in the next year than that. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.